Alright, hello everybody, Resonance here, and today I'll be giving you all my commentary on an Age of Empires 2 viewer game where I compare the Genitour unique unit to the Imperial Skirmisher unique unit in the African Kingdom's expansion to Age of Empires 2 HD Edition, which you can find on Steam. The Berber Civilization was added. I have an overview video on that. You can find a link to it in the video description below. And they give their team the Genitour unit. Everybody on their team gets access to this mounted skirmisher unit, which really changes the flow of the game, doesn't cost gold. In addition, in the Rise of the Rajahs expansion, we finally got the long-awaited Imperial Skirmisher upgrade, which the Vietnamese grant to everyone on their team as well. Thank you so much, Delta USA, for the 34 months resub. Really, really appreciate it. So, during this video, I'll be comparing the two units, their strengths and weaknesses, and how they compare to each other. But of course, they're two very different civilizations, and they each have their own unique set of pros and cons. Welcome to the stream, everybody. As always, it's a pleasure to have you all loading in here. I selected these civilizations, of course, as part of my weekly Twitch TV live streams. If you'd like to get in on this, you can find my live stream schedule by going to my Twitch page and scrolling underneath the video player. The map today is a map that I actually made this morning specifically for the stream. It's like if Fortress was a normal map. It's fortress with palisade walls, essentially, and you don't start with farms, you don't start with houses or barracks, but you still have your little watchtowers. And this is intended to give these players a little bit of time to build up in the early game safely, where we can get to the late game and start to see the Elite Genitour and the Imperial Skirmisher come into play. So first, while we're waiting for our players to build up, I'll use this as a brief opportunity to introduce everybody. So, we have first the Imperial Skirmisher team, Steven Sutton will be our Red Byzantines player, teaming up with the Avenger, the Teal Aztecs, and Desinsect, the Purple Vietnamese. Each of these civilizations happen to have an excellent bonus for their skirmish units. The Byzantines ones cost less, the Aztecs ones get plus one attack and plus one range with the Oblodal unique technology in the Castle Age. Man, doesn't sack to the Vietnamese player, he gets an additional 20% HP on his skirmishers in the late game, as well as all of his archer range units. That's pretty sick. So. Let's take a look at the other team. On the opposing team, it's the Berbers. We have Groove Metal as the Green Berbers teaming up with Samos, the Yellow Turks, who gets an additional 20 HP on their Genitura unit, thanks to their very, very niche unique technology, Sapahi, which gives their Cavalry Archer units plus 20 HP. Very odd tech, we'll talk about that more in a minute. And the final teammate they'll have is Henry Plant Jeanette, who will be the Blue Mongols, where their Genitures fire 20% faster, which is an excellent bonus, for the Genitour unit specifically because it happens to have an attack bonus. Attack speed bonuses are really, really good on units that deal additional damage to certain types of units because they get to keep applying the bonus damage. <laughs> Indeed, Bunkies. So, let's talk about the Elite Genitour's stats. So it costs 35 wood, it costs 50 food, and it takes 23 seconds to train. Compared to the Imperial Skirmisher, that's 35 woods, the same wood cost for both of them, but the Imperial Skirmisher costs half as much food at 25 food, and it trains in 22 seconds. I just bet I blew your mind. <laughs> How many of you knew that the Imperial Skirmisher takes one fewer second to train? This changes everything. Of course, this doesn't actually change that much, but I, I'm having fun with it, so. <laughs> The, yeah, the one second doesn't actually matter. The, the food cost, though, is fairly substantial, but we have to remember the metagame role for these units. So, in the early game in Age of Empires 2, it's all about players setting up the economic foundation for the rest of the game, building a lot of villagers, trying to collect a lot of food and wood, get to the next ages. But once we get to, like, around the Imperial Age, look at Groove Metal propping up his gate for a nice, smooth little boar lure. It's great. Once you get to the late Imperial Age, gold becomes a fairly rare commodity, a very tough resource to find, and in team games this forces players to massive trade carts, but a lot of the time you end up having to mix in units in your army that don't cost gold. These trash units like the uh, Elite Skirmisher, the Halberd Deer, as well as the Light Cavalry Hussar type units, and what's really nice about the Elite Genitour and the Imperial Skirmisher is that neither of those units actually cost gold, so they're extra powerful late game tools that you can leverage against your opponent to kind of starve them out eventually slowly draining them of resources. So it's actually quite nice to have a ranged support unit that is more powerful than the Elite Skirmisher in your arsenal. This is especially relevant because the Halberdier is generally a stronger unit than the Elite Skirmisher, even though that doesn't make it OP or anything, but it is just a bit stronger. And the Elite Skirmisher has an attack bonus versus it, but the Imperial Skirmisher is so much better versus Halberdiers and just in general. So, but how much better is the Imperial Skirmisher than the Elite Skirmisher? So, they both have 35 HP, but the Imperial Skirmisher is one more attack, so it's got four instead of three, which matters a lot uh, against 
any unit that has armor. It also has one additional pierce armor. The attack bonus that they have goes up by one versus archers, so it's four for the elite skirmisher, five for the imperial skirm, and then the elite skirmisher deals two extra damage versus cavalry archers, and three versus imperial skirmishers, three versus cavalry archers. Their spearman attacks are actually the same, but the additional one attack that the imperial skirmisher has in general is what actually matters. But here's the cool part, and why I'm doing this specific uh, this specific video is that the cavalry archer units actually take bonus damage from the Imperial Skirmishers attack bonus versus archers and cavalry archers. So the Genitour actually ends up taking a ton of extra damage, uh, and particularly cavalry archers and things like Mangadai. Uh, so overall, the Genitour is significantly more pop. Viewlock doesn't even work. Okay. <laughs> overall, the Genitour is significantly more pop efficient because at that stage of the game, you don't actually care about the 50 food cost compared to 25. It really doesn't make that big of a difference. But what does make a difference is the additional stats the Genitour has. So it has uh, 55 HP, which is 20 more than the Imperial Skirmisher. They both have the same four attack. The Imperial Skirmisher has one more range than it with five compared to four for the Elite Genitour, but the Elite Genitour is way faster. It's 1.35 move speed uh, compared to... I actually don't know what the Elite Skirmisher is. I think it's like 0.9 or 1 or something like that. It's, it's a lot slower. 1.35, and that's without um, Husbandry. It has one fewer armor, but still, like, it's pretty sick. It's a really, really strong unit. And they both have plus five bonus versus archers, and the Elite Genitour has one less bonus versus cavalry, which is plus two compared to plus three. Notably, it has zero attack bonus versus spearmen, actually, so the Elite Genitour is a lot worse versus halberdiers than the Imperial Skirmisher is, even with good micro. So, the more you know, maybe you'll learn something. Dude, what the hell? Thank you so much, Sean, for another hundred dollars. What? Seriously, thank you so much. That's like really, really, really nice of you. Damn, man. I, I really appreciate it. And I have to think of what I'm, what I'm going to use that money on. I Seriously, thank you, dude. That's that's way too kind. The donations are really appreciated. They, uh, you know, I work 9 to 5. I'm really busy. But I always try to find the time to make YouTube content and, and stream for you all, even though it doesn't make me very much money. Uh, I do it because I love the community. And you know, thank you, Spooky Sean, for helping me pay the bills. And That's oh, so nice of you, man. Super duper nice here. So, some of you might be wondering, you know, Troy, you've been throwing a lot of numbers at me. What do the numbers mean, Mason? What's the better unit? I would say that it depends. In general, the Genitour's massive, bulky body is better. Uh, and they have movement speed. Like a huge movement speed advantage. So you can actually do some serious writing with the Elite Genitour in the late game. And the 50 food versus 25 food isn't that significant. You have the economy to support it. I like the Elite Genitour slightly better. However, I like it better compared to the Elite Skirmisher. The Imperial Skirmisher, like, it's... It has one additional range. It's much better versus Halberd Deers. It's better versus uh, Cavalry Archers to a degree. I feel like the movement speed, though, the additional movement speed and the additional health is just more useful in general. Um, and you have some, like, insane bonuses for them, right? Like, the Turks get plus 20 HP on them. 95 health total on the Elite Genitour is actually nuts. Um, the Turks actually get all upgrades for the Elite Genitour. Oddly enough, the Berbers, and, and this is something I didn't like about their Civ design at first when they didn't have the all the Archer armor upgrades. Thank you, by the way, Tantail, for the 17 month resub. So the community loves you too, Rez. Happy to support your streams. They're entertaining and informative. Enjoy catching up on YouTube, too. Thank you so much, Tantail. It's really nice of you, man. So, one of the things I didn't like about the Berbers initially from a design standpoint is that they used to have weaker genitours than everyone else because they didn't have ring archer armor and they also didn't have parthian tactics uh two upgrades that were very significant to have now they have ring archer armor and the civ has been rebalanced around that and i really love that balance change so major credit decision there for taking that suggestion and but they don't have parthian tactics so they don't actually have the best uh best genitours the mongols Plus 20% faster firing rate is actually pretty sick. I, I have to give an honorable mention before the action really picks up in this game to our friend the Saracens. Some people in the chat were a little confused earlier thinking that Zealotry applied to Genitures. That would be absolutely batshit insane. That is not the case, thank goodness. Uh, but here's what does work with Genitures. Cavalry Archers plus 3 attack versus buildings. Oh, come on. Come on. It's pretty sick, right? Uh, that doesn't really have much of a competitive application, but it's it's cute. So they get an honorable mention. Recurve Bow, I don't believe the Magger's unique technology that gives plus one attack and one range for Cavalry Archers does not work in the Genitour for some reason. Probably just for balance purposes, otherwise it, that might actually be too good. 
Does not work with the Genitour. Would probably be insane. Uh, also, the Hun's discount on Cavalry Archers does not apply to the Genitour. Probably, again, for balance reasons, because it would be insane. The Vietnamese uh, Imperial Skirmish, for those of you who are curious, is 43 HP compared to 35, which is pretty significant. But really, like, you can't evaluate these units in a vacuum, and that's why I'm casting this particular game, because we get to see how it plays out later. Because they all come attached to unique civilizations. Uh, the Berbers, for example, it comes attached to a civilization that has a 15% discount on stable units, which is actually a nuts bonus. It used to be 20% in the Castle Aid. And the Berbers are a lot better, better balanced now, and they have a really strong unique unit too. That's just good for its stats. The Camel Archer isn't generally used as a way to deal with uh, Cavalry Archers, but, I mean, maybe we'll see it here. <laughs> uh, no, I doubt it. Uh, this is against the Imperial Skirmisher team. They're not going to be making any, any Cavalry Archers. Yeah, I doubt it. But yeah, I mean, the, the Berbers is a pretty sick civilization in general. The Vietnamese have been a somewhat controversial civ in the community recently, considered to be fairly weak. Uh, the, it's mostly because the Vietnamese don't actually have an early game economy bonus of any description, so they tend to fall behind early on. They do have three extra HP in their archers in the Feudal Age, which does help them come out on top in Feudal Age skirmishes, but... And it works in their skirms, too. But that's not generally enough. Civ is okay. In the late game, at least it has all the necessary eco upgrades, like guilds. I mean, it's got bow saw, it's got crop rotation, so, you know, but... Civ's not so hot. I'd say the Berbers are, are generally nicer. Uh, but then again, you know, the Genitur team ha does have to deal with the Turks. The Turks being a <laughs> rather binary civilization in that they require so much gold, they need that money, or they just don't do anything. Uh, but with gold, they're very powerful in team games, and when they're on the same team with the Berbers, that's some nuts synergy. I don't even know if that's balanced, to be honest. Giving the, the Turks a trash unit that they never had before, and one of the best ones in the game, an elite genitour with 95 HP. The One of the things that balances out the Turks is that they don't even have elite skirmishers. Uh, they only have hussars. They only have sp uh, regular spearmen, so... In the later stages of the game, very gold-dependent civ, and then now they have just insane elite genitours, so I'll have to see how that turns out. Here comes the scout rush. Oof. They missed someone's message? Uh, let's see... Want to stream EC the Lion? Yeah, they are sick. So this scout rush is going to be not super effective from Steven Sudden, and the reason being, of course, is that players do start with Palisade Walls. I felt like it would create a really interesting dynamic to take Fortress and try and turn it into more of a standard map where, yeah, rushing is a little bit discouraged, but unlike Fortress, it's not... <laughs> or you can just be like Henry and turn the map into Fortress. Okay, I get it. I turn the palisade. I turn the stone walls into palisades, and he's just like, no, 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 no. I want to play regular fortress. That's okay. That's okay, Henry. You get to do that. <laughs> I thought this would open up a wider variety of strategies where players are actually capable of being rushed, but they do have to get through these walls because I did want the game to go a little bit later, somewhere between Arena and Arabia, so that that way we can see the skirmishers and the genitors actually coming into action. I mean, Steven's applying some pressure here. When we're looking at it from uh, you know, a strategic analysis standpoint, he's slowing down his castle age, but he's not over-committing to this. He should stop making scouts, though. Okay, good, he did stop. Good. Uh, I was going to say, he should probably only make, like, three. I think he made maybe too many scouts, because he is wasting some of Green's resources, right? By forcing these houses and a little bit of idle time, so it, it would have not been... So devastating for Red's economy, I think, if he made fewer scouts, because making five, you're getting diminishing returns here. You're not putting any more pressure on these palisade walls than you otherwise would be. Ruben with the Seed Workshop. Interesting to see what kind of build he goes for. So, Yellow. Or Yellow Turks player with a double stable. So this is where the 20% faster gold mine from the Turks does come in handy to pump out those knights. Meanwhile, it looks like Blue's just going to be booming up. Safety of his own walls. Not a huge fan of this town center placement, but he's doing this because it, it allows him to perfectly surround it in farms. But generally, I like to put my town centers where they're either protecting, like, a gold and a forest, or at least just a forest, if at all possible. Because I think that Blue's economy, this actually does matter, is oversaturated on this one lumber camp. Once you have more than four or five villagers in a single lumber camp, they really bunch up on each other, as we can see here. And that adds up. It's one of those things that's difficult to quantify, but if you actually test it out, it matters a lot. So Blue's going to need to build a secondary lumber camp because he didn't build this town center 
uh, right up against the tree line, and that is costing quite a bit of resources. So these knights are much better at breaking through palisade walls than these scouts are with the 10 attack versus 5. Free light cavalry upgrade. Oh, not bad, not bad. He's got the plus 2 defense for maximum watchtower resistance. He's in there. Welcome to stream, shit man. Good to see ya. You're just in time for Steven to get raided. Now, Steven watched my pikeman overview tutorial. He knows that you get the forging upgrade. Well, he might have got it just for his scouts. But the forging upgrade is really important for pikemen because it allows them to kill knights in one fewer attack. However, he's in the feudal age, so it doesn't matter in this case with the spearmen. And he just needs to get the castle age. He actually does have the resources to afford it. Is he missing a building? He's not. He just needs to click the button. Click it, Steven. Do it. Do it. There we go. All right, he did it. Nice. Okay, so the knights are in there. He is the Byzantine, so he gets the discounted camels, which will be quite useful at dealing with this night raid, but he's in big trouble. The quick wall, not here. It's not even a wall. No, it's got a hole, so he's going to have to run his villagers away, but his town center is almost at maximum occupancy. He's in big trouble, and he's got a lot of idle time uh, right now. Ooh, looks like Yellow, though, is content to attack the wall while those scouts wail on him. This is why you get the plus two defense as well. <laughs> Red's in a lot of trouble, but I think ultimately he'll be fine. Meanwhile, it looks like Teal going to grab some relics, being the Aztecs with 33% fast relic income for the entire team, including himself, makes the relics extra valuable. So, grab that early, looks like he's just booming up. All eyes on Red, he needs a lot of help. Spearman, not so great against knights, but this is his only option, he is responding to this correctly, but he has to remember to focus fire down the knights and fight underneath his town center, ideally. Question is... Do you guys think you should build a defensive watchtower to protect this area? Uh, it's up for debate, but I don't think it'll be that effective, mostly because yellow already has the plus two defense, so this watchtower will only be dealing one damage without fletching, uh, even with the garrison villagers inside it. It will be a deterrent, but it won't be great. I mean, really, like, red right now is just falling apart at the seams. Like, he's not controlling his units at all. Like, he's just got idle scouts. He's got idle villagers. Um, he's going to need some help. Pocket crossbows. With no, with no fletching, Resonance 22 objects. Uh, I would recommend Eagle Warriors in this case, especially because the Avenger happens to have a lot of monks and relics. Dude, what? Nice. This guy's getting raided by Groove Metal. He's coming in there bringing the lion with him, too. Gonna take down some villagers. Got the defensive monks here. I mean, you can just convert these and you should be good to go. But yeah, I would have really recommended, like, pocket uh, Eagle Warriors in this case. The Eagle Warriors trade okay with the Knights. Good delete here. Denies one conversion, but one of them gets really lucky roll there, so the Avenger gets a pretty fast conversion. Yeah, I don't know, Pocket Crossman is just too slow, like, he didn't get to, to help Red in time, and uh, neither of these two players really controlling the unit set effectively to, uh, to deal with Samos' aggression. Ay, 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 what a disaster. <laughs> what a disaster. Red's gonna need some help. Um, I mean, I put the Palisade Walls here to, to help make the game go late, but, oh, he's, he's backing up? Where are you going, son? Where are you, where are you going? Huh? The battle is over here, friend! You don't need the expos in your own base. What the hell? All right, all right, Avenger buddy. This guy needs help. He's making all the right units. So I know Red isn't controlling his units very well, but that's just because he's newer at the game. It takes experience. But what he needs is crossbowmen. What the fuck? Okay, well, Red will clear this out anyway. It's fine. <laughs> Uh, that one. So, here we see one of the classic issues in Age of Empires. Where Red will come out on top because he is the Byzantines and he's got discounted spearmen, he's got discounted camels. The bargains are here. Finally, the first teal crossbow shots are fired. Good lord. <laughs> oh, but he's not even going to land a single shot either. And I think he does. No, he's got fletching now, so he's at least dealing two damage. Nice. Okay, so. Red will eventually be able to clear this out, but we see the classic AOC problem of until you have pikemen, the spearmen are not so good versus knights, uh, and you need, you need the pikemen upgrades very expensive. And it also takes away from time that you'd otherwise spend creating said pikemen. So anyway, Red will survive this, he will be okay, so now all eyes on the other side of the map. What will Teal do with his very large army of dudes? Mm-hmm. Looks like he is going to go for a team wall, that's pretty cool. Meanwhile, what's Purple up to? Purple's probably just booming. He's got a defensive monastery. This will help ward off the night rushes. We often see this on Arena, where players will build a monastery to either go offensive with the Monks plus Mangnals combo, or just defend themselves with the same combo. The Monks are a great way to deter night raids, because the Knight is such an expensive unit, and it's... Knight's fast, but it is melee. 
which means that it does give the monk ample opportunity to get a conversion off. Especially when you're dealing with Aztec monks, which have additional HP. So where the hell is this army going? I don't know, because Purple's on his team. This is such a slow pocket army, I'm very, very confused. This is a powerful army, don't get me wrong. He's got the Bodkin. He's in here. I think he was trying to deal with some of the Genitures and Groove Metal, but I... I don't know where this army's going. I think this army... He's gotta do something with this, right? Ah, he's protecting the area so he can put down some houses, get the housing development going on. Market coming down, town center for Teal. So what team has the advantage? Well, it's definitively with the Genitour team. The Mongols player, Henry, let's see what population he is at. Henry is at 77, and we compare that to Purple, the person who's been booming the most on the opposing team. Oh, he's about tied. Okay, so that's, that's pretty good. Meanwhile, Groove Metal doing some serious raiding with the Nice Plus Genitourus combo. I really love the balance changes that they made to the Genitourus, uh, giving them plus one range and minus one attack in the Castle Age. That way, <laughs> the Genitour, you can kind of live that Berber dream of of raiding your opponent with a full mounted army of cavalry archers and genitures. Doesn't actually work that well in practice though due to the cavalry archer just not being that strong outside of the Huns due to its very high cost and the amount of upgrades that you need uh, to actually take advantage of that. It's like Blue's gonna drop a castle? That's the only reason why you would send this many villagers forward and if we go toggle on the fog of war, will this castle be seen? Well in the stream, Hyuna OP. Ooh, is he walking too close? Ooh, I... I think this fellow does he have Town Patrol researched? Is this Town Patrol line of sight? Does anyone know? I think this is Town Patrol. I think Purple has researched Town Patrol before 30 minutes in. And there we go. That's That upgrade's paying dividends. However, due to HD spaghetti code, Purple might not notice this because it doesn't appear in his minimap. You see that? It's not in the minimap. But you can see the corner of the building. And that's because it'll only appear in the minimap if the center of this building is visible. Mechanics. Does he see this? If you're scrolling around, you'd see it. Blue. Inching line forward with some Mangadai. But he is doing this against... Uh, ooh, wait, no, no. This is not going to work at all because the Vietnamese have Rattan Archers, which are an archer that's very strong versus other archer units due to its high pierce armor. I believe it's like four in the uh, Castle Age. Quite powerful. Uh, the Mangadai might be one of the best units in Age of Empires too. However, I think that this standard build like, the Vietnamese, if they do one thing well, and I, I swear they do something well, it, it's beat this build. Kinda. Kinda, sorta. I mean, you, you throw some bombard cannons in the mix to take out the siege, and... I mean, then you're cooking. You're cooking some kind of stew. It's a... I'm going off on a tangent here. It's a pretty slow stew. Don't really game eco to get the ingredients you need, but, uh... I don't know, it's edible. This, though, I don't know. I mean, if you get enough mangonels for blue, you can kind of beat this army. And these are the two titans of this game, are, are purple and blue. They, they've been booming up the most. The difference here, though, is that blue has the backup of some yellow knights, which the rattan archer is very bad against. Very, very, very bad against. Just, God, he's even repairing the mangonels. Look at this sick play. Siege Workshop come down for purple. This is the correct play to get down your own mangonel. You need your own siege weapons to deal with this, basically. Let's well, see so you guys the Imperial Age first. I mean, Purple's on his way. If I go to uh, Blue's perspective, well, Blue's gonna get there slightly first. Meanwhile, Green, gonna try and secure some map control on the other side by walling. Teal, what is he doing with his army this game? <laughs> Teal's actually playing very well. If you look at his score, he's one of the most, he's one of the most powerful players in the game. And he has the potential to swing this game entirely in his team's favor. It's just his troop positioning, like he picked like the slowest units in the game. He's just walking around the map, getting his cardio in, calves the size of watermelons. Where is his army going? I have never seen this in the history of Age of Empires 2. Pocket crossbow monks. That's the Aztecs, and he's going to the enemy pocket, too. This is the slowest build I've ever seen, but it's going to work, too. Because I don't think yellow... Because yellow... Okay, one? Yellow is losing all of his knights in this big fight. And look at the way purple is segmenting his base like a badass here. I love this. You see this with this palisade wall? He's created one hell of a defensive perimeter, and I love this cast positioning, too. On the hill. I mean, I would love it if the villagers were safe, but it's almost sick. He just has to regroup his rattan archers over there. I don't know why the Rattan Archers move so fast. Actually, I do because they are hilariously similar to the Plumed Archer. Uh, yeah, I mean, once he gets his castle up, I mean, he's kind of good to go. And and he's just in there. I mean, this is why I made them Palisades and not Stone Walls. <laughs> Slowest build I've ever seen, but the Avenger doing what he does best. An Avenging Red. This is sick. <laughs> 
This is so sick. Thank you so much, Frosted Caribou, for hosting my live stream. Really appreciate it. Those of you who are not aware, Frosted Caribou is an Age of Empires 2 streamer as well, and I really appreciate the host. You can check out her channel uh, if you're interested. And for those of you who are coming for Frosted Caribou stream, uh, I am an Age of Empires 2 caster. I started the first Age of Empires 2 channel back in 2009. Right now, I'm doing some community games like I do every week on Twitch. So just playing with the viewers. So if you'd like to play with or against me, or to play against my other viewers, and get a chance at the spotlight on YouTube, by all means, you're in the right place. Also, if you're looking to learn Age of Empires 2, um, I usually offer a lot of strategy tips. So, blue, green, and uh, purple are all in the Imperial Age. Mangonel out for purple. This is important to remove the battering rams. And purple will hold the line here. Why? Because the backup from Yellow is not here, because Yellow ended up dropping this castle. He built that forward, and he didn't build him his own base, because who plays around pocket Aztecs crossbowmen plus monks? <laughs> this is actually so sick, because it's forcing the retreat from Blue and Yellow. Yellow has to pull back all of his units, and the monks cover the crossbowmen's weakness very well tonight, converting all of them. This is a very annoying army to deal with. It's actually pretty bulky, and... I mean, they're removing so many yellow knights. He killed so many yellow villagers. Yellow dropping and score, just plummeting, thanks to Teal's bold play. Of course, this will get mopped up by the Mangadai. But the Mangadai, it's a slow build for the Mongols. They have to get the elite Mangadai upgrade. They have to build all the castles. The units itself create very, very slowly. And what this is doing is this is alleviating pressure from purple. And this is important because we're at that Treb War stage, and you know whose buildings are made of paper mache? It's the Vietnamese. They do not have masonry or architecture, which means they just lose Treb Wars. Now, Blue, not born yesterday, has the masonry upgrade to try and give him a little bit of the edge in this Treb fight. But the thing is, is there's just no support here. Like, Blue doesn't have his Mangadai to come in and snipe those Trebs. He doesn't have Yellow's Knights to do that either, because he had to retreat to deal with Teal's slow, but actually really smart attack. So major credit to Teal, their big play. And what this is doing as well is creating space for Red to build back in the game. And look at Red with that very balanced map generation. That is, it takes an extremely good player to, to get a forest to just, you know, curve like this, and then, and then get a cliff that's like this, and a forest like this. If he just builds like a house over here, look at Look how fucking disgusting this- look at this! This is actually one of the most disgusting maps I've ever seen, in terms of forest generation. He just needs to close this- what? Look at that! It goes all the way to the edge of the map, too! And it protects this gold and stone, and he has a gate that's not blocked. What? Okay. It's pretty good. So anyway, this push stalled. Purple looking strong. It's all because Teal went for the pocket. Blue needs to move his forces, though. He really does. Now, Yellow. This is a well-positioned defensive castle. I like this. This will uh, make it so it's a lot harder for his opponents to actually get some military units in there and raid his own base. Yellow needs to recover economically. He's still in the castle aid, very, very far behind because of that raid. Let's go check out exactly how far behind at this point. So this is his perspective. So, okay, good. He's actually on his way to imp. It's just he has low pop. God, I just can't get over this map generation. Look at, look at this. Look at this. This wins tournaments. It's so good. It's so good. Fuck, I wish my maps were always like that. I'd never lose. <laughs> That's what I tell myself. Purple! It's purple! The Flexer! Trying to drop the hottest mixtape of 2017. What is this? What is this town center placement? God damn, does this man have any fear? No, he doesn't. This is disrespect. What? There's a castle right here. I mean, Purple knows this. He knows there's two castles right here. Now, one did go down. But hey... Maybe he can mine that gold, a man can dream, we'll find out. Janissary is coming down for yellow. I don't know, I feel like the Vietnamese are very good anti-archer civilization. And all the numbers that I gave you at the beginning of the game, while relevant, the data is just to help you inform your strategy but not decide it. Because you have to look at the bigger picture of things. And the genitour is attached to a civilization. The Imperial Skirmisher is attached to a civilization. And it's the other units that are being really decisive here. So for starters, these guys are just making armies that the Vietnamese dumpster. If you want to make the Imperial Skirmisher look insane, you make all these units. Now granted, Yellow has a lot of Hussars and Knights in his army, and as a guy who's played the Vietnamese since well before they came out, uh, I can tell you that, that the Vietnamese just struggle super hard versus a mounted army. And the Turks are capable of doing that. Like you just you mix in some mounted units and you should be able to clean this up. But the Mangadai, like I don't understand what they're supposed to do here. It's like Henry is uh, he's on autopilot, right? Because they're always good as the Mongols. Until they're not. <laughs> Until in this case. 
He needs to make something else. Now, what should he make? Oh my god, my seal library hasn't crashed. Need to fix that. Uh, what should he make? He should make, oddly enough, stable units. Uh, I'd actually like to see some Hussars mixed in with the army. I think that you can still mix in Mangadai because they're good units, but he needs to mix in some mounted units in there. Thanks so much, Timonius, for the three month resub. Really appreciate it. Yeah, Turk Genitors are busted. I mean, honestly, they're so good here. They're still even good versus the uh, Imperial Skirmishers. They're, they're good enough at least. Okay, so deal with a bunch of pikemen on the defense. Okay, nice. Okay, so Blue will be mixing in Hussars with his army. But again, I just think that they're getting bodied by the trash units here. So Team Imperial Skirmisher, a little low in the score department because Steven, he might have the map of the gods, but he doesn't have the villagers to back it up. So his teammates are going to kind of have to 2v3 as Green. Green's getting ready. He's moving out. The pretty powerful Berber's army. Look at the stats in this thing. I'm salivating at the sight of it. It's coming in. So what this is doing is this is forcing Teal to back up, so he can no longer back up Purple. Can Purple 2v1 this? I mean, he's got the army to do it, but really, it's going to come down to is can Red build back up because Yellow, Yellow not stammering, not stuttering at all. He's building back in this game. He's missing a lot of upgrades, but he's getting there. We're almost there, guys. 70 HP. Come on. So wait, does that mean that he has Sapahi, but no... Wait, no, he has... No, he has Bloodlines, but no Sapahi. That's what it is. Bloodlines, but no Sapahi, and he doesn't have the Elite Genitor upgrade. So Purple kind of 2v1-ing this, but what he need, but they're making more and more Hussars, and no Andean Sling for these Imperial Skirmishers means that Purple's going to have to adjust his build and mix in some other units. Now, the Rutan Archer has one extra attack over the Arbalest, which makes them much better versus Hussars, but you got to mix in some Halbs or something, man. This is when the Vietnamese really start to fall apart at the seams, because they don't have Camels, they don't have Husbandry, they don't have Blast Burners. At least they have a stronger Elite. Well, they're really good versus Archer Civilization. So, what he needs to do is make a bunch of barracks and build some shitty halberdiers. And then he should be able to kind of ward off this army. And the Vietnamese offer tremendous utility to people on your team who aren't playing the Vietnamese. Giving Imperial Skirmisher to everyone on your team is really, really, really insane bonus. It's, for example, nuts with the Aztecs with that Lotl. It's fantastic. Is it worth the other drawbacks? Mm, it depends, it depends. The Avengers gotta get a lot of upgrades because he's missing quite a few. And the Berber's army... I like the units that he's making. This is super well balanced. It's also a budget army too. And he's only spending gold on the hand cannoneers to deal with the pikemen, uh, which otherwise his army struggles really heavily against. Because remember, we learned today that the elite genitour does not have an attack bonus versus pikemen unless you get the, uh, the Parthian tactics upgrade, which the Berbers don't. So you mix in the hand cannoneers, and now you're cooking. You're cooking a Berber stew. And here comes Steven Sutton with some of the worst camels in the game from the Byzantines, but they don't cost very much. Now, I think camels are great versus this army, so I love that Red is doing this. Let's see how this battle goes for Red. Swap over Red's perspective over here. Now, the reason that these are so bad is they're missing Blast Furnace and Bloodlines because the Byzantines don't get those technologies, but uh, the Berbers, a camel civilization, this army is extremely weak to camels. Extremely weak to camels. Actually, Red in here to save the day, and this game is extremely close and shaping up to be a great, great game of Age of Empires 2. I'm enjoying it. Well, the stream is on video. Good to see you. Hey, Windy Sales as well, and hello, Phoenix. Are you sure Parthian Tactics doesn't apply to Genitures? That's really weird. There are a lot of things that don't apply to Genitures, even though they should, because that's, like, hard-coded that way. Like, for example, they don't benefit from Recurve Bow, even though they should, because they're Cavalry Archers, but that would also be imbalanced. But they're affected, uh, I s they're affected by the Mongols thing, though, the 20% faster attack speed, and they're affected by Sapahi just because fuck it. They're affected by Sapahi because the Turks needed it. And they're not affected by Recurve Bow because the Maggers didn't need it. So it, it doesn't actually make any logical sense. It's just for a balance standpoint. But I am glad that the developers actually do prioritize balance over logic because the Elite Genitour, if it had all those bonuses, would be... it would be too strong. So... Oh yeah, that's true. I was thinking that the... I thought Parthian Tactics applied the additional damage versus Pikemen, though. But not the armor. But I have to double check on that. I actually might be wrong. Because again, it, it doesn't actually the whatever the genitor is, it's just a hard coded mess. So <laughs> the most important thing uh, a part about missing Parthian tactics though for the Berbers is not actually the genitor is it's just for the elite camel archer, which I'm assuming is also some sort of hard coded spaghetti. But uh, it's mostly so that this unit is not even better than it already is and doesn't uh, shred right through pikemen. So just food for thought. Now purple getting pushed back because uh, you know the Vietnamese aren't known for their their broad tech tree. Uh, and actually, he's just not making anything that 
isn't archers. And he's trying to now, but it's just too slow. And all right, some points for the uh, the Genitur team. But come on, man, get Sapahi. Do it for do it for me. Holy shit! Did you see that play? Did you see that play? I think in my last like 600 Age of Empires videos, I have not seen someone do that. So purple made a petard at his castle to deal damage to the seed rams because the petards actually deal damage to seed rams. Clever girl. It's a big play. However, big play for a man with a little economy. He is dead. He's very, very dead. Purple. Coming in here with the heavy camels, which do mop up this army. Oh my god, our camels so good this game. Jesus Christ. If only he was a civ that wasn't the Byzantines. Look how good camels are this game. Seriously. This single unit beats every single unit in this entire match except maybe the hand cannon here. What the fuck? This unit's so good. Oh, come on, Red. You can carry the game. Every I've never seen three players in a game have made an army that just gets dumpstered by one unit. A normally well-balanced army gets dumpstered by one unit. The Janissaries and hand cannoneers are okay versus camels. They're okay. I think it's good enough. But, like, oh, man. Come on, Red. You can do it. He just doesn't have enough pox. He doesn't have enough economy. Like, what's this? You need to make them villagers. You need at least 100 villagers every game if you want to win. You need at least 100. And you know what he doesn't have? He doesn't have 100 villagers. Ah! Ah! He's putting down the stables. He needs more camels. Come on! Come on! Corvix says, uh, Rez, can you tell Cision to get rid of the ram constantly staying information except for box information? Maybe? I don't know if he can fix that, but... Uh, maybe. <laughs> yeah, there'll be another game I do the CMVD. God, camels are so fucking good versus his army, but he just can't make enough of them, and they're all so bad. Camels are so bad without bloodlines and blast furnace. Really, really bad. The, I think the only city that's worse camels is like the Ethiopians or something, right? Disney camels are super bad, but they're cheap. Okay, the Avenger making the right units for the situation. The Evil Warriors are pretty good, but he's just getting bodied by these Genitures and the Berbers army in general. Just great unit choices from green, and I, you know, it was just purple didn't quite adapt properly. But I think it speaks highly of how well he's been. Oh my god, of how well he's been playing this game, because he's still the top scorer in his team despite not having a base. So he's going to transition into elite battle elephants. Now I hate the Vietnamese battle elephants. I think they blow blow ass chunks because they don't have husbandry. The Camaro ones are so good because they have husbandry and they have 15% fast movement speed. They also want a blast furnace, which is also bad. 30 HP I do not think offsets that. Oh, he's going for Cavalier. What? I don't think extra 30 HP offsets that. I don't. Um, it does mean that they get to live an extra hit versus a Halberdier, but I don't think it offsets that. He's not making battle elephants. He's making Cavaliers. Cavaliers is also good versus this army. In fact, battle elephants without husbandry maybe just don't work at all versus the Genitors. Samo's giving me blue balls by not getting his, uh, plus 20 HP. <laughs> no Sapahi. If you guys are wondering why Sapahi was added to the game, uh, it's actually a really interesting design decision, and I actually, I like it. Um, it might seem like an overly niche weird technology that doesn't make any sense, but it's cute. I, I like it because it encourages different builds and strategies. And I like all the texts that do that. I don't like boiling oil that doesn't do that. Uh, or strongholds, for example, for the Celts, that just makes their castles better versus rams and shit that's really lame um makes it what they're like castles yeah it's just put castles fire faster how lame is the tech i need to look it up yeah castles and towers fire 20 percent faster for a civ without they don't even have keeps do they bad i don't like that that doesn't encourage interesting play styles you're gonna build castles anyway um but i like sapahi because it it makes you consider doesn't mean you'll research it because he's not ripped makes you consider cavalry archers as a potential alternative um, as, a, as a unit. And when would you ever build that? Well, so Sijin was hoping to give the Turks a tool to actually deal with the Mongols in a one-on-one -on -one situation on a map like Arena, uh, where generally the Turks really struggled versus like the mass Mangadai style build. I mean, yeah, the Turks had heavy camels, but they still kind of struggled versus the elite Mangadai. And actually the heavy cavalry archers with plus 20 HP are a pretty decent answer to Mangadai. It's incredibly niche. The textbook definition of niche, but it's... It's cute. I like it. So, the Imperial Skirmishers team still getting bodied right now, having a really rough time versus such a strong, well-rounded Berber's late-game army comp. I mean, Red's making the right units, but his eco is still way too small. Like, you should you should never... He needs an additional 20 villagers uh, to sustain unit production at this stage in the game. He's making all the right units. He does not have the elite Imperial Skirm, though. Yeah, these guys pushing forward. Purple's trying to recover. I mean, he did with this army. I mean, the Cavaliers, how good are they? Oh, when you're missing all the upgrades, not so great, but he... 
they're very good versus the opposing army. I mean, perhaps the binary nature of the Gen and Tutor team's army will be their downfall. I mean, Eagle Warriors are great too. These guys are down but not out. It's correct to not resign in this situation until one more player falls. Because they have the Elite Eagle Warriors, which are excellent versus basically everything besides the Hand Cannoneers. And it's not like Green's making that many of them, you know, he's just he's just sprinkling a little bit of them on, on his army. Just a little bit, just for taste. It's not the bulk of his army. I mean, this is they have cost-efficient answers to this. <sighs> Teal just has to win this fight. I mean, maybe if he can get a good fight in a hill? I don't know, I don't know. Let's see, I missed a couple people's messages. Uh, thank you, uh, Aliba... Or, okay, I'm going, I butchered your name, my bad. It's... Is it Ali Bad Hutch, Hutchut? Ali Body Hutchut? I think so. Thank you so much for your donation. He says you didn't get a proper uh, bow raid, and I feel sorry for that. So I'll tell you secret instead. In 1998, The Undertaker threw mankind off Hell in a Cell and plummeted 16 feet through a Spanish announcer's table. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, Ali Body Hutchut, I think is how I pronounce your name. Thank you so much. Big battle going on here between our Aztecs player, the Avenger, as well as the opposing Turks player, who still does not have Supahi yet. And Blue, who is at the back. I mean, because they're not fighting in the same in sync. I, I, I mean, Teal's kind of winning this fight. He's got the Imperial Skirmishers, right? And I think he has Atlatl as well. I, can, can he win this fight? He does have Atlatl. Nice. That's pretty sick. I mean, he's going to win this fight two versus one. So it's really, it's up to Steven. Can he do it? I mean, if Steven would just get his upgrades and make some more villagers, then I think I would vote for him for president. Steven, you're making all the right units. You've got... You've got the ingredients to make an excellent dish. But, you're serving the food raw. I need padded archer armor, I need chemistry, I need imperial skirmisher, I need villagers, but you're so close, and you're actually winning these battles. However, groove metal. Moving the line forward with some trebuchets. He's got Siege Engineers, that tech I keep mentioning every single game, because it wins games. Look at him shredding right through this castle. Cutting through it like a knife through butter. <laughs> Having too much fun with this. I mean, the Berbers here, look, he's got double the score. He's got the eco for this. I mean, do you want to know how much eco he has for this? Oh, at least, actually, that's not that. I thought it was going to be an insurmountable lead, but honestly, look, the fact that Steven, he has no upgrades. But he has all the right units for the situation. So he's just dying slowly. <laughs> Imagine a guy who has been like shot like five times. He's like bleeding profusely, but he's got so many, so many band-aids, just amputating all the limbs. I mean, at some point, Steven, unless he's an octopus, will run out of limbs to amputate. And yes, indeed, that is the case. One castle down, seven tentacles remaining. Will Steven be able to hold the line? The answer is no, because he does not have the eco for this. And yes, blue in the economy with the rating. I think that's it. All tentacles gone. Steven down. Kraken has been slain, and now, yeah, I mean, purple's dead too. They put up a really good fight, the Imperial Skirmisher team did. Uh, they made some sick plays, but in the end, the Genitor team comes out on top without Sapahi. God damn it! <laughs> Believe me, Turks with Sapahi is really good, but I'll show you in another video. Hope you all enjoyed watching this video. <laughs> uh, Mr. Real Statistical says you can't have too much fun in this subgame. Agreed. Deal doesn't have Chem? Does he not have Chem? Well, how's he gonna cook with Jesse without chemistry? Oh, he does not have... Does not have chemistry. Damn it. So many missing upgrades. So many missed opportunities. But such a good game regardless. Yeah, it should be 4 plus 5. Without Lotl plus chemistry. GG, man, that was a great game. Steven, you like almost... You like almost clawed that game back. Like, from such a... You lost so many villagers early on. Like, props to you for staying in the game, sticking with it, and building back. Uh, you made all the right units for the situation. Like, you, Steven, you know your units. And that's good. That's very good to see. Because a lot of players, actually most of the players in this game made the wrong units for the situation. But you were making the right units. You just need to make more villagers, Steven. If you make more villagers, you're going to be 3,000 ELO in no time. You're going to overtake the Viper and be the best player in Age of Empires too. But yeah, I think you made too few. I'll check in the achievements in a moment. Um... Yeah, you need 100 villagers and some extra upgrades. But you were making all the right units. Whereas a lot of the time on the other side of the map, like, the momentum kept shifting back and forth because these players weren't making the right units for the situation, but they had the eco. So if we could just, like, fuse Steven together with, like, Purple's body, I think we'd have the ultimate player. I think so. Yes! Oh, you're so close, dude! You're so close! 
98. <laughs> yeah, I always try to offer constructive criticism. For every time I, I point out something I think a player can do better, I always try to point out something they do right. Uh, it's really demoralizing for players to hear the things they're doing wrong, because no one plays perfectly, and I want the pressure to be on them. I want everyone to feel good about something, so... Yeah, you were making all the right units for the situation. You're, you're so close, dude. You're so close. Make, like, uh, 12 more villagers, and then you're, you're good. Okala Laponic says, yeah, Rez, easily 3k. It's that easy. It's that easy. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, as nobody points out, guard towers are actually very good versus mangonels, and that's only because... Uh, it's like a weird thing that doesn't come up too often in your average game at AoE 2, but it, it matters. Because the guard tower has 6 attack, which is the breaking point for dealing with uh, the mangonel, which has 6 pierce armor, so if you get bodkin arrow... You're dealing quite a bit of damage to the the Mangonal. You're actually dealing two damage a hit. Whereas with Bodkin Arrow with Watchtower, you're only dealing one. And when you have garrison units inside a guard tower, that really, really matters. So the few times we see guard tower utilized in competitive play, it's generally because they... I mean, one, you already had the towers in the first place, or two, because it's very much an improvement versus Mangonel. It's great. Uh, and the upgrade's super cheap. So yeah, guard tower is one of the more underrated upgrades. I'd say masonry, though, as well, is another one that's just not researched frequently enough, and... Once you start losing your entire base, do you only realize that masonry is very, very good? Yeah, I'm gonna do another game after this. It's great. It's a great game for everybody. Purple played his mind out, but he just wasn't able to transition into the right units properly. Uh, he just it was also you know getting attacked by two players at the same time because Avenger had to turn his attention southward. So Purple almost held the line. God, his I have to go back and watch that. It's, okay, so there's so many good moments in this game. Like Purple with his. Immaculately well-crafted early Imperial Age defense was so beautiful to watch. And then uh, Teal with his really slow Castle Age push, but yet yeah, super effective getting in there into yellow. But they didn't phase yellow. It was a really good push, but yellow and blue responded appropriately. They retreated, and yellow ended up building back to have the largest economy in the game. He didn't get Sapahi, but he got Sapahi in my heart, and that's where it matters. Uh, and green with an ungodly KD, just showcasing the Berber's mass-ranged army. is excellent. It's, it's really excellent. It's a great game. Yeah. Some of these players didn't quite get up to 200 pop because they didn't have enough villagers or unit production facilities, but they were close. Okay, so I'm going to take a brief break, and I'll be back in a couple of minutes with the next match of the live stream. We'll do another drawing. Uh, maybe I'll do something to nobody. We'll see. Uh, so thank you so much for watching the stream so far. If you enjoyed it, then uh, please do follow me on Twitch, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. I will put this stuff in the comment, uh, in the uh, chat below. Sasa. You think you figured it out? It's not that easy. You can't just queue up for the next drawing before the drawing even starts, before I even take my break. That's cheating, Masasa. If that worked, everyone would be doing that. So you gotta wait for the drawing to actually start to type exclamation mark play. Nice try. <laughs> Joe Relief asks what microphone do you use? I use the uh, Blue Yeti. Very, very good microphone. It's a fantastic microphone, but the Blue Snowball is also good as a budget alternative, in my opinion. So anyway, uh, more tutorials, expert games, and commentaries on my YouTube channel, as well as videos for other games. I really appreciate the support for the stuff I do for games beyond just AOE 2. You know who you are. Thank you for keeping my sanity and for doing your part to grow the AOE community and really support the channel. So if I convince any of you to actually check out the stuff I do for other games, that'd be fantastic. Be right back. I'm going to take a quick break. I'm going to grab a glass of water. And I'll be back in approximately five minutes. This also says it doesn't give me more slots, it still only take one slot. No, it doesn't do anything at all. It doesn't. Um, until the drawing starts, you can't type exclamation mark play. It literally just ignores it. If it worked that way, everyone would be registering in advance, so nice try. I think so, Abdullah. I think the AOE2 community is fantastic. Like, that's why I keep streaming this game. I don't do it for the money. Uh, it's gonna be absurd. <laughs> I also totally don't do it for the views either. Um, but seriously, thank you, Spooky Sean, for the donation. That makes up for the crippling adpocalypse, which devastated me on YouTube's stupid monetization policy now. Just, yuck. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Alright, we'll be right back. Thank you for your support. Stay tuned, please. Don't go anywhere. Next game on the way. Oh, he did, Rahul Twitch? Oh my god! Please tell him thank you so much. I'm really flattered. I I try. Uh, Rahul Twitch says, someone in Viper stream just asked for a good channel for AoE2 noobs, and Viper recommended your channel. That's seriously super sweet. Oh no, I, I've seen League of Legends, Abdullah. I've played... Maybe like 5,000 hours a league. Alright, I'll be right back. Stay tuned. <laughs> 